So we are in a sermon series lately on the Garden of Eden story. The, the main title of the series is Eve, Adam, and the Snake. And then each uh, one has a subtitle, which I'll share with you mo momentarily. This is the fourth segment, though. It, it's interesting to, to work with the same scripture uh, again and again each week for a while and to focus on different things and hear different things. So listen closely. Uh, those of you who are here each week, you've heard this a bunch of times now, but It'll be the first time for some of you, I'm sure. Genesis 2, verses 15 through 17, verse 25. And then we jump to Genesis 3, verses 1 through 13 and 20 through 21. The Lord God took the man, Adam, and put him in the garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you may eat freely of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. And the serpent said to the woman, did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that's in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it, or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not die, for God knows that when you eat, your eyes will be opened, and you'll be like God knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. They heard the sound of God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of God among the trees and the garden. But God called to them and said, where are you? And Adam said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And God said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree from which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit from the tree, and I ate. And then the Lord God said to the woman, what's this that you've done? And the woman said, the serpent tricked me, and I ate. The man named his wife Eve because she was the mother of all living. And then God made garments of skins for them, for Adam and for his wife, and clothed them. So as I said, we're in the fourth segment now in our sermon series on Adam, Eve, and the snake. The first three are all posted on our website, and we have enough of them now. I can't possibly recap them all without taking too much time. So they're there if you want to catch up. Today's message is called The Serpent, Fear, Hiding, Blame, and dot, dot, dot. So let's start with just a few thoughts about the serpent, the snake. Who or what was the snake in the garden? And what I'm going to say now may be a bit unsettling to some of you because part of why I'm doing this sermon series is that I think a lot of us have been taught things about this story that aren't necessarily true, that aren't actually said in the text itself. And the real problem is that, I mean, we've had some misunderstandings, I think, but the real problem is that's caused us to miss some of the deeper meanings and the gifts that are actually in this text. More times than not, 
The serpent in the garden is regarded as what? Go ahead and say it out loud if you want. Yeah, somebody said it. The devil. The devil or Satan, right? The, okay. But what does the text itself actually say? It says, now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. In other words, the serpent is part of God's creation. And it's part of God's good creation. The scriptures say everything was good. Everything God made was very good. What it does say, though, is that the serpent was crafty. And the Hebrew word is translated, that's translated crafty here. It's a Hebrew word, uh, Aram, A-R-U-M. I want you to say that out loud, Aram. Okay, I want you to get this down because we've all got some Aram in us, okay? So, you know, you, we may get to a point where you can say, oh, I, you know, you, that was a good, good use of your Aram. You know? Stay with me. The Hebrew word can also be translated shrewd, sensible. Prudent, cunning, or clever. Some translations even use the word wise. In fact, it's the same word used throughout the book of Proverbs in contrast to the foolish or the naive person. Proverbs 14, 8, for example, says, it is the wisdom of the clever, the Aram, or the wise, to understand where they go, but the folly of fools misleads them. Proverbs 14, 15, the naive or the foolish believes everything, but the prudent, the Aram, considers their steps. It's the capacity as it's often put in the 12-step world, to play it forward. Think things through. What's going to happen if I do this or that? So in light of all this, the story could be telling us something like this. The conversation between Adam and Eve and the serpent is an allegorical way of describing the inner conversation we all have when it comes to living according to the intention of God. We all have the quality of the Aram within us, the capacity to question, to doubt even, to be skeptical, to weigh things out, to say, is that really true? The issue is, how will we use that capacity? Will it be in service to God, in rhythm with God's intentions, or to something else? And there aren't a whole lot of other options. In one way or another, if we don't use our human emotions, the full range of our human capacity in service to God, we will in one way or another be using it in service to ego, to the small self which is that part of us that somehow gets diluted, and this is telling us, this is all of us, remember, to somehow think of ourselves in separation from, that we're autonomous little units. We can just do what we want. And if we separate that from the processes of, or the service, the call to serving God, then we're going to go in a destructive direction, almost in inevitably. So, the serpent is telling us it's the process through which we misuse our, God, our God-given Aram. And instead of using it to find wisdom, it's that part of us that can rationalize and justify and excuse and make a good case for almost anything, including things that are very harmful and destructive ultimately. There's a little acronym for ego. Uh, some of you have heard it, I'm sure. It's called uh, ego, E-G-O, stands for edging God out. And the ego awakens in the wiggle room. When we misuse our Aram, and we start 
ah, you know, did it really mean this or that? And, you know, and if I do this or that, and you will, and, uh, you know, God will forgive me no matter what. We start creating some space where our ego can emerge and awaken and take over the process. Now, I'm going to just blow through the rest of these things in order to get to a story that I want to close with. But we could stop right here. I mean, it, you know, if you really heard what I just said and, and just said, what if we thought of this story as telling us something about ourselves, all of us, that we all have this inner conversation where we will be tempted to misuse the power of our own God-given capacity to think. Once Adam and Eve made the wrong choice by misusing their Aram, immediately upon eating the fruit, they all of a sudden saw that they were naked. They were completely exposed. And they're ashamed, they're afraid, and they start covering up. They grab some fig leaves, the nearest thing they could find to cover up their, quote, private parts. They knew they did something wrong, and they went to a place of shame. Go back and listen to the first sermon in the series if you want a deeper take on the shame part. But many spiritual teachers and psychologists have pointed out that there's a difference between guilt and shame. Guilt is often said, uh, it's, a, it's a matter of becoming aware that you've done something wrong. It can be as long as it isn't prolonged, a very healthy thing. It's our soul's way of telling us that we've gone in the wrong direction. It's kind of like our inner GPS. Something inside us says recalculating. You know, you've made a wrong turn. But shame says you are something wrong. That's the difference. And I'm going to just come out and say at this point, I don't believe that shame is ever from God. Ever. Guilt, yes, but I agree with Richard Rohr, guilt that lasts from more than five minutes is not from God. Its purpose is to catch our attention and alert us that we have gone in the wrong direction. If you don't listen to it, it's going to stick around. But its purpose is simply to wake us up and say, hey, you've made a wrong turn. Let's get back on the right track. Shame says you are bad. You are wrong. That's why you've been. That is never the truth. So Adam and Eve are naked and afraid. And they hide. They start hiding. They start hiding from each other and hiding from God. So what's this telling us all? telling us that doing the wrong things makes it wrong thing makes it very difficult to live in the open why ah, cuz you know you've got something to hide you start looking over your shoulder hoping you don't run into this or that person you avoid certain places. You don't answer the phone when certain people call. You prepare your story ahead of time just in case a certain question gets asked. You start using your Aram to make up a good story. And again, you know, this is all of us. You ever done something where, you, you know, that, that, I mean, I'm not talking about some even some big dark thing, just something you knew wasn't the best thing to have done, the best choice. And you start preparing, you know, how you're going to respond to someone who questions you before you've even been asked. Get your story straight. I mean, maybe I'm the only one that, that does this stuff. Then it tells us God comes looking for them. Now, let's just stop right there and make sure we all heard that. God wants us to know that when we make a wrong choice and start going to a place of shame and we're hiding and we're afraid, God's always going to come looking for us. And the question in one way or another is something like, hey, where are you? Where are you? 
And it's not as if God doesn't know where you are. It makes all the difference in the world when we finally stop hiding, say, here I am, and start taking an honest look at what's really going on. And so Adam says to God, first thing he says was, I knew I was naked. And I was hiding because I was afraid. Afraid of what? This is the first time fear comes into the biblical narrative. Of being found out. Of being exposed. You know, that's one of the most common fears just about all of us share. It goes something like this. If you really knew me, you wouldn't like me. If you really knew me, you wouldn't accept me or want me around or let me in or love me. If you really knew me, I would be unacceptable here, wouldn't I? And shame is how we turn that all right toward ourselves and feel that way about ourselves. You know, there was a study years ago in which thousands of psychologists and counselors, many with PhDs and very busy, busy practices, and who were paid very nicely for their advice and their work, they were asked what their greatest fear is. And the question was anonymous on this questionnaire, so they could be completely honest. And the overwhelming majority of all these psychologists and counselors said, I am most afraid of the imposter syndrome. I mean, that's what they called it. They said, I'm afraid people are going to find out that I'm a fraud. Because despite all my training and experience, most of the time I'm winging it. And I'm just kind of hoping that I don't do somebody some harm by saying or prescribing the wrong thing. I'm afraid people are going to find out I really don't know as much as they think I do. God says to Adam, who told you you were naked? And all God wanted Adam to do was come clean. Tell the truth. And so the Bible tells us that Adam and Eve both took full responsibility for their actions, right? No. <laughs> Just the opposite. And this is where next week's sermon will start. But we'll at least notice it this week. Adam blames Eve. That's going to get its own entire message. Eve blames the serpent. Talk about that next week. But I wanted to end today by sharing a story. It's a real, true life story. I have changed most of the names to protect the not so innocent. But listen for some of these themes as they come across in the story. And as I keep on saying, this is all of our stories. So I, I've known this guy in the story. I'm going to call him Gary. I've known him for my entire life. I can't remember a time when I didn't know this guy and his family. His family had a lot of money. And Gary always had everything of a material nature that he wanted. He was that guy, you know, with the newest and best of everything. He was a good guy. I liked him. But I began to notice as we got a little older, he, he seemed completely clueless of how well off he was and how advantaged and entitled he was. It started to get a little obnoxious. And he was never satisfied. It was like, you know, there was always something newer or better. He'd be the guy that would see the commercial and he had to have it. And, you know, sure enough, he'd be the first one to have it. Gary's mom was a total sweetheart. And she adored Gary, of course. 
and kind of doted on him. His dad was a Korean War vet who had been through some horrific things in Korea. And later on in life, I learned what an impact that had on him. He was very successful in the financial world in Wall Street. And he was a tough guy, scotch drinking, chain smoking, no nonsense, man's man. Not very warm, not real good with relationships. And I know Gary was kind of scared of him. As we got older, the toys got bigger and more expensive. And Gary's misuse and kind of clueless disregard of the value of things increased as well. Got into high school and Gary started doing drugs and drinking. Just partying, most of the kids in my high school did. But he went at it with a lot of gusto. And Gary was really smart, but he had this capacity to make really dumb decisions. And he could convince himself that a really bad idea was the thing to do. And he always got caught. I mean, you know, he just wasn't very good at it. <laughs> Periodically, I'd get together with Gary and we'd talk about some of his misadventures. It's not that I was a goody-goody or anything, but by comparison, I was like, you know, Gary, I'm not going to hang out with you too much, man. It's like, you're always getting into trouble. What are you thinking? I mean, he was my friend. What, what, what are you doing? And he always would just kind of laugh it off and, and talk a good game and rationalize things and justify things. And it was always somebody else's fault. It was always the circumstances. You know, he was that kind of kid that, that would complain that the teacher gave him a bad grade. Parents started buying him cars. He always had a nice car. He started drinking, doing stupid things. He, had, he wrecked at least two or three cars by the time we got out of high school. One time in one of his accidents, he was drunk. He, he, uh, there was a person with him who got really seriously injured. And uh, his parents hired a fancy attorney and got him off. I don't think he even went down on his record. He walked. But you get the picture, right? It's like you, get, you start here. This, things aren't going to end well for this kid, are they? He finished college after a few starts and stops, flunked out once, got kicked out once, but finished. And then he finally just said to his parents, hey, you know, I want to go out to the West Coast. Uh, I want to get this business going. He talked this great game about getting some business going. I don't even remember what it was. His parents gave him a lot of money to go out there and to find his fortune. He goes out there. Before long, the business never took off. He blew through the money. And then his parents started hearing from him less and less. And it got sketchier and sketchier. But he eventually would call because he needed money. And his dad started to get really mad about that. And his mom said, I don't mind because at least he calls and I know he's okay. And then the calls stop completely. Nobody knew where he was. His parents started getting really mad, or really concerned, rather. And finally, his dad said, I'm going out there to find him. And he said to his wife, he said, look, I know you want to come. I think it'd be better if I did this by myself because I think I might need to go some places and do some things that it would be better for you not to see. And she agreed. He said, I'll call you every day. This is a true story. So he flew out there and started asking around. And they got very concerned, by the way, before he went out there, they started calling places. Anybody that they knew that her son had said he had a connection with, no one knew where he was. And when they finally called the apartment complex that he said he lived in and the apartment manager had never heard of him. 
So his dad went out and to make a long story short, his trail led him into some very, very dangerous, dark places. And he finally was in a very bad part of town. It's a major city. And he showed the picture of his son to a drug dealer who said, yeah, I know that kid. He told him where he was. And his dad went to an abandoned building and started crying out, Gary, where are you? And finally, a very soft voice says, Dad, is that you? Dad? And he found Gary on a mattress on the floor, alive, but not very. And later on, years later, Gary told me about what happened that day. He said, you know, when I heard my dad's voice, I, I thought I was probably dead. And how could my dad have found me here? And he said, my dad took me in his arms. And he said, come on, son, we're going home. And he said, you know, at first I was so ashamed but I said, no, dad, leave me here. I deserve this. I've ruined everything. He said, my dad looked at me and said, you've ruined things? And Gary said, yeah, this is all my fault. I'm a mess, dad. I don't know what to do. And Gary told me years later that his dad eventually said to him that he knew things were going to be okay when Gary said, I've made a mess of things because it was the first time in his darn life he took responsibility for anything. No more blaming. And at that moment, all his dad said was, you're my son. I love you. I don't care what you've done. It's not over. We'll figure this out together. You're coming home with me. And his dad took him home. And Gary got into recovery. He had a spiritual awakening as a result. He and his parents all did some work together. Gary's dad took him into his business. And Gary became a stockbroker of all things. The rest of us couldn't believe that when we heard that. And he actually did very well. He made his own money. He's been sober for close to 40 years. Still has lots of nice toys. But he also has a lot of gratitude and took care of his dad as his dad died. And is still taking care of his mom, who's in her 90s now. Now, if you didn't hear the Garden of Eden in that story, I'm not making my points clear enough. I've ended the last few me messages with the end of the text, which is after everything that happened, God made clothes for them and covered their shame. And in essence said, let's keep going and find our way together. And that's the basic pattern that gets repeated throughout scripture, you know. God trying to help us live with love at the center. We humans thinking we know a better way, losing our way, experiencing consequences, messing things up, being found by God again, and God just saying, come on home. The whole Bible is one experiment after another of God trying to do that. So it's time to stop. We will pick up next week with blame and projection. But I'll just close with this question. 
where are you? All God ever asks is that you just simply say, here I am, wherever you are. Now and then it's nice if God finds us just thriving and doing fantastic, isn't it? That's certainly possible. And then we get to just be part of the process through which God finds other people who need to stop hiding and stop being ashamed and start the journey home. That's enough for today.